months ago, if you remember, the Lord kept talking to us about understanding the value of God's presence. You know, when we started talking about the train of his robe, how when the train of his robe fills the temple, we just need to know where we're at. And not just behold the glory of the one that sits upon the throne, but also be ready to make contact with the robe of his presence. And I thank God because when it comes to the revival of engaging the presence of God, it typically could start with one person. But then, it then can spread to everybody else. Do you remember the story of the woman with the issue of blood? The woman with the, with the issue of blood, she stood there and she had a revelation. The revelation that she had was that Jesus has to be the high priest. Because she knew, being a Jewish woman, that wait a minute, wait a minute, there is a prophecy that says that when the high priest comes, when the Messiah comes, he would come with healing in his wings. We know that scripture, don't we? But the original word in Hebrew was not the wings of a bird, but it was talking about the um, items, I can't, the embroidery that was attached to the hem of the garment of the high priest. Because they knew that the high priest himself was a man, but he was standing in as a shadow of the high priest that will be immortal according to the order of Melchizedek. And so when she stood there, she was like, if truly this is the high priest Messiah, then there must be healing on the hem of his garment. Because whatever is hanging at the tip of his garment must be healing. And the Bible says when she declared that prophecy of old, that if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. What did the Bible say after that? The Bible said afterwards that many more came to touch the hem of his garment and as many as touched the hem of his garment were made whole. And so it is not unusual for heaven to begin a revival with one person and then allow for others to come into it and then it becomes a widespread privilege that everybody taps into. And what I am beginning to see here, just months into the revelation of the robe of his train or the train of his robe, I am beginning to see and recognize that many more of y'all are also engaging the train of his robe and the robe of his train. And for those who are here, you know what I mean. If you want here, please go listen to the messages because there is a difference between observing the train of his robe. You see, this is what happens when you go to a wedding and the bride is putting on a garment or a gown that has a long tail. Everybody else sees the long tail, but the bridesmaid gets to experience it, gets to carry it. And so the train of his robe is the description of those people that are looking from a distance. But the people who are close enough, they talk about the robe of that train. And I believe that that is where we all need to get to, wherein the tangibility of the presence of God should not end at your ear as a description by somebody else, but it needs to make it to your heart and as an experience that is personal. I tell you what, one of the things that we have been so blessed with here in Communion House is the presence of God. You see, it takes sacrifice, but nothing that God has not already given to us. You see, God is not going to ask you to sacrifice what he hasn't already given to you. So when people say, oh, I want to live my life a certain way, but it takes a lot of sacrifice to live like that. We often think that we need to get a pat on the back for making a sacrifice. No, God is only asking for that which he has already given to you. So don't get me wrong when I say that it takes a sacrifice to experience the presence of God like we do here because I'm not saying it that I may take any honor unto myself but I say it because what is in our hands here at Communion House, we lay it down. It costs us so much to be here and we're thankful to God that we recognize that he is the same God who gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. The sacrifices that we have to make to be here without compromise is a privilege by God. But look at the outcome. The outcome is we come in here and we can tell for a fact that we are in the presence of our Heavenly Father. I don't know about y'all, but on Saturday, while we were here, there is no doubting the fact that we were in the presence of our Heavenly Father. Tuesday last week, we were here and we heard the sound. And once that sound came forth, it comes with power. 
And we, don't have, we didn't have to wait for months to see the outflow of that power. So I want to encourage you folks, if you are not yet making contact with the robe of a strain, it is not too late. Continue to be present in his presence and continue to persevere without any, what's the word? Without giving up. I want to encourage you, do not give up. Many people have stopped six inches short of a mine of gold. And so don't say that, well, I don't know, maybe God just chooses some people that he reveals himself to. No, no we don't. The Bible says God is no respecter of persons. If you would come to him believing that he is God, the Bible says whoever must come to God must first of all believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So all of what I am saying with all that rigmarole is that I pray Oh, I'm thankful to God because more and more people are beginning to enjoy the presence of God like I enjoy it. And I pray that by the grace of God, more and more of us will press into that, wherein not only are you hearing the sound of the voices of the people in the room physically present, but you also hear the sound of the angels. Let me say this. Um, I don't know if you noticed, there was a particular portion that we got to. I'm hoping you didn't notice because you were supposed to be worshiping God too. That I was singing even though the, the band was done with that song, but I wasn't letting go of it because it was still reverberating in the room that I was in. And then I started crying because of the fact that I knew that the voices that I was hearing, that I was singing along with, were not the voices of the people in the room. Matthew cannot sing like that. You understand what I mean? Neither can Tyler. And it was definitely not Alan, but I knew the voices that I heard. And it just broke me because I'm like, man, who are we that you are mindful of us? Why would you assign your angels to come and be in the place where we are? And he says, because you have come to the place where my name is. And, and the angels know better than to avoid the name of God. They gravitate toward the name of God. And so I want to encourage you, don't wait until somebody comes to lay hands on you. Remember that conversation we were having here? Do not wait until somebody comes to cast out demons out of you. You are in the presence of your heavenly Father where darkness cannot stand. Open yourself up in the presence of God and you'll be amazed at how clean you will be. Remember Isaiah. Isaiah was standing in the presence of God and there was still uncleanliness inside of him. But the moment he opened his mouth and he says, oh, I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips, immediately an angel of the Lord, a seraphim, not just an ordinary angel, but a seraphim came levitating with their amazing wing selection and they took a coal from the altar and put it in his mouth and his mouth was made clean. Because he opened up, if he had kept quiet, there would not have been an opportunity for the glorious light of the presence of God to penetrate the darkness. So don't wait for a man when you are standing before the God of creation. So I want to encourage you, the presence of God has everything that you need. We're going to pray very quickly and then if the band wants to step down, then they can at that particular point in time. But this is the prayer that I want to say. The Bible says in John 3, 16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life father let us have a divine supernatural by your hand understanding by your by the ministry of your holy spirit understanding of what that soul means when your word says for god so loves the world let us come to know more of the magnitude of that love that we may believe as we should. Father, let this be even now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, God is good. God is good. And I want you to continue to say that prayer on your own and just say that I may know the magnitude or more of the magnitude of the soul. When the Bible says, for God so loved the world, you know one of the things that Apostle Paul never stopped begging God for was to know more. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. Even after he had been through the shipwreck, even after he had seen the dead come back to life, after he had fought the beast of Ephesus, what did he say? He still said that I may know as I am known. You see, because you only believe to the extent that you know. The Bible says, how shall they believe what they have not heard? 
So what you have not come to perceive, you cannot believe. And it is the combination of perceiving and believing that results in receiving. And so continue to ask him. Many of us have already believed what we know. But still, we're not where we need to be. And so what does that mean? Does it mean, mean that you need to re-believe what you already believe? No, it just means that you need to believe more. And how do you believe more? You have to know more because you only believe that which you come to know. A man cannot come to believe the Lord Jesus if they haven't known about him. You understand what I mean? And that's why the Bible says, how will they know except we tell them? Because how will they believe something that they don't know? But for them to know, we have to tell them. You see, and for us to tell them, you see, we're not the only ones who can tell them. Let me just say this. In a way, we have been commissioned to tell them. But after we have heard, how do we know more? Who is going to tell us? We have angels that continue to minister to us. I can't remember who I was talking to earlier today and I said to them, I said there are certain things that we just cannot know on our own or break out of, I believe it was Alan that I was speaking to, unless the angels come to reveal to us. And so when you're asking God to reveal more to you, that you may know more, what you're doing is you're exercising the privileges you have as a heir or an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus. To know is your privilege. It is said in God's word that it is the glory of God to conceal things, but it is the glory of kings to search them out. Right? It is your portion in the land of the living to have a knowledge of the things of God. The Bible says that the things of God, the divine knowledge, even the hidden mis even the, the secrets of the hidden mysteries are given to us and to our children. And so if these things are there, what is stopping me from receiving them? I need to know. So I'm encouraging you, get yourself seeking out the presence of God Staying put in the presence of God like you don't want to miss a thing. And whilst you are there, open yourself up for a cleansing, for a sanctification. And then open your mouth to ask for things. You understand what I mean? Now, there is a difference between you asking for things outside of the presence of God. Many people don't make it into the presence of God because all they are doing is asking for things. And when you are only asking for things, you do not get the fullness of the presence of God. It's like standing outside the gate and yelling out to the king and say, hey king, can you toss me a couple of things? He might not even hear you. You understand what I mean? But the Bible says that I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So you need to first of all seek the presence of God. And when you get there, then you can open your mouth and ask for things. One of the things that the Lord's been speaking to me about lately, which I'm going to share with you tonight, is this. I started talking about it, I believe, on Tuesday, because on Saturday we didn't really talk. We were just praying, right? We need to have more meetings like that. Okay, well, not every meeting is going to be like that, you know, because after a while, you know, what we try to do is we try to build a tabernacle around an experience. And every one of us can be guilty of that. Because even me, after Saturday, I was like, oh, maybe this Tuesday we should just pray again. And then while I was here thinking it, Brother Matthew sent me a me message that says, oh, we need to have more meetings like that. And I'm like, yeah, I agree. But in reality, we have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because at the end of the day, we can continue to crave experiences like that and God will give it to us. But the thing is, how much of that can we receive when we are still at our faith level from yesterday? Our faith level needs to go up. And how does your faith level go up? By you believing more? How do you believe more? By knowing more. Alrighty, you see how these things connect together. And so when you get to the presence of God, what do you do? You open your mouth and then you ask. It is not a shame to ask for things that you may not even be ready for. Because how will you even know that you're not ready until you ask and they tell you where will you put it? You understand what I mean? Because a lot of what we don't have is because we don't have the capacity. We already have the access. The access we have to God is by grace. Right? We already have everything. The Bible says that God has given to us every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He has given to you and I everything that pertains to life and godliness. The Bible says that God has given to us all sufficiency in all things and at all times. When you think about it, God is saying everything that you will need, I have given to you in abundance. 
and is available to you at all times. It is all sufficiency. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, I believe. All sufficiency in all things. You have everything that you need and at all times. So the question now is, why don't I have it in my bank account? Why don't I have it in my heart? You have promised me all this joy, but I'm not feeling joyful. Where is all the stuff that you have promised? And God is saying, well, you have as much as you have made room for. You understand what I mean? God is asking you to do one thing. Just make room. Look at the woman of the, the widow of Zarephath. There was, the Bible says that the anointing, I mean the oil continued to flow until she ran out of room. But you know what we're doing is quite often we, huh, let me say this, concerning the presence of God, I know that I wasn't finished on that subject. I am begging you, don't ask from afar. Come close. When you're close and you know that you have the presence of God. If you still want to ask at that point, then ask. Did you hear what I just said? Because quite often, when you come close enough, some of the things you wanted to ask, you will not ask anymore. Oh yeah. No, no, this is a, this is a common experience. If you get close enough to the presence of God, some of the things that you wanted to ask for, you will not be able to ask because the light and the presence of God would have exposed the carnality in your desire. It would have exposed the futility of your ambition. You see what I mean? That is the reason why you don't want to ask from afar because while you're asking from afar, there could be things that are hidden from you. You could be saying, no, I'm going to go to God and get him to do this and do that and do this. And by the time you get to the presence of God and God says, you were saying, you're like, God, you're good. You're a good God. You are wonderful. You're amazing. You see, this is something that has happened to me time and time again. In fact, even till yesterday, yesterday night, I believe it was, or maybe the early hours of this morning, just in the last 24 hours, I had a couple of things on my mind and I had been pushing it to the side all through the day, saying, okay, I'm going to settle this later. And so when I got to the presence of God, after a while, I remembered that I had a list that I came with but then it didn't mean anything anymore at that particular point in time because God gave, God gave me a glimpse of what he was doing. And I'm like, if this is what God is doing, then I don't have to worry about this and that. You understand what I mean? So you save yourself the trouble. You understand what I mean? You save yourself the trouble. One of my cousins put it best this way. He said to me one day, he gave me a call. He said, do you know that if you believe what God has already said about you enough, 80% of what you ask God for you will not need to ask God for anymore. He said, imagine what you can do with that extra bit of time. He said that you can start to do the things that he commanded rather than begging him to command some more. You know what the Lord said to us on Saturday? Was it Saturday or Tuesday? That we trivialized the sacrifice that Jesus made Jesus came to die on the cross and before he died on the cross, he modeled an example to us of how, what it means to be light in the world and salt of the earth, what it means to be a son of God here on the earth. He demonstrated all of that to us and then the peak of, demonstra of the demonstration was that he gave his life for us and that was why he says, greater love has no man than this than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. And after he did all of that, we have come to trivialize all that experience and sacrifice to an anticipation experience wherein we're waiting for him to come and do it again. He didn't do all of that so that we can continue to anticipate. He did that so that we can what? Participate. You understand what I mean? So that we can participate in what God is doing. So many of us, what we're doing is we're anticipating that God will bring a blessing so that you can go and do what he has commanded you to do. But imagine what life would be like if you truly believe that he has already given to you everything that you need and you just get up and do it. You understand what I mean? Some of us, you know me, I like to use unforgiveness as an example. Some of us are waiting for God to touch our hearts to make a heart soft towards somebody. Or you're praying that God should make them at least come and apologize before you go ahead to release them from your heart. You see, so you're still anticipating when you are supposed, in fact, to participate in the work of forgiveness. Because the Bible says that Jesus, Jesus speaking, he says, now y'all have been given the power to forgive. Jesus told his disciples, he said, whoever you forgive is forgiven. 
You understand what I mean? So rather than stay there, waiting for some kind of miracle of heart transplant to happen for God to remove the evil heart in them and put a new one, God is like, but you are my co-surgeon. You are my fellow, you are my co-laborer. You are to participate in what I am doing and your part to play is to get up and forgive them. Pick up the phone and, and determine to make peace and then you'll be amazed at how your heart will just melt as the phone is ringing. And how their own heart will melt. Have you ever called, have you not called someone before to apologize and they're like, please, before you say anything, I just want to say that I am sorry. Is that your doing? No, it is the Lord's doing. But then he's invited you to be a co-laborer. One of the things that God is hammering on us in this time that we're in is remember that this is 2023, our year of going forth. Matthew asked me yesterday, or maybe a few days ago, he said, what is the difference between going and going forth? Have you asked yourself the same question? I think my wife did, because when I was answering you by audio message, she was there, she was like, mm, oh. I was like, oh, okay, you're welcome. You know, she, yeah, I was trying to be humble about it, but yeah, it didn't work. See, the difference between going and going forth is how many people did physics here in high school? Wow, that's a lot of people who did physics. So you remember the concept of scalars and vectors. What is a scalar? A scalar is an entity that has magnitude, whereas a vector is an entity that has both magnitude and direction. So if I draw a line on a piece of paper, that line has magnitude. It's a scalar, right? Because I can tell you that the line is two inches long or six inches long, or I can use it to represent miles by comparing it to a scale. But it is just a line. We don't know what that line is pointing to. But the moment you put an arrow on one end of the line, then the line becomes a vector, wherein you can tell whether it's on the y-axis or the x-axis. You see what I mean? And so the difference between go and go forth is that go can be in any direction. So God is not just telling you to go. Because if he tells you to go, you can decide to go back. If he tells you to go, you can go nuts. If he tells you to go, you can go to sleep. You understand what I mean? But God says go forth because go forth is a vector. It is an instruction that comes with a direction. And it is important for us to know that. Why is that important? Because there are still so many of us that subscribe to the Martha spirit, a spirit that just wants to do without direction. And you get tired and you complain to God. And you say, God, I'm so, I'm so tired. They don't even recognize my effort in that church. Oh, they don't even recognize what I'm doing in that office. Oh, these clients of mine are useless. They have no sense of appreciation. Look at all of what I'm doing. Yeah, because you keep going here and there. There is no direction. So you have a lot of motion, a lot of movement, but no motion. And so when God says to go forth, the critical thing about going forth is that you need to hear God every step of the way because only God can determine where forward is. Let me say that again. Only God can determine where forward is. Now let me ask you, how can God determine or how does God determine where forward is? You need to understand where you're at where he got you from and where he's taking you to. The reason why God alone can determine where forward is, is because from God's perspective, you only make progress when you're getting closer to him. So wherever God is, is the direction that you should be heading. Every compass that we know of, myself and Chris were just talking about this, every single compass on earth is always pointing to the north. It's called the true north for a reason. Simply because it is an, it's an indicator of how God designed human beings were supposed to always be heading in the direction of where God is. And God is in the north. David told us that. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Which is the reason why every compass points north because that mountain of his holiness is in the middle of the earth. 
Some people would have called it Maru. But we know that mountain, the mountain of the Lord, is so strong in intensity that everything points in that direction. And it's called the northern city of the great king. David calls it Zion. And let me tell you something. If you are moving away from God, you are not making progress. So to go forward is to always get closer to God. And how do you get closer to God? There's only one way to get closer to God. In fact, I wish there were two. Or maybe I don't because it would have been more confusing. There is only one way to get closer to God. Do you know what that is? To follow his word. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. And so for you to get closer to him, you have to hear every word that proceeds from his mouth. Now let me summarize the four things that I have told you because we're going to look at about two or three verses of scripture and then we're going to pray. The very first thing is that we need to recognize that as believers who are privileged to be heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus, we shortchange ourselves when we are only happy with beholding the train of his robe. We need to come closer so that we can experience the robe of his train. You need to be close enough to be able to grab a hold of the hem of his garment so that you can be made whole. That is thing number one. Thing number two is that when you find yourself in that presence, do not conceal any part of your life from him because whatsoever you conceal from the light remains in the dark. You need to open yourself up and say like Isaiah said, I am undone. So that the light from the altar can come to illuminate the darkness that might be in you. And by so doing, what you have as an experience or as an outcome is that the things that are immaterial are exposed and you can stand before God ready to have a meaningful conversation about progress. So some of those issues that you bring to him become non-issues when you get in his presence because when you hear his word, it brings so much to life that you don't even have to fill up some of the pockets that you bring. They just get filled on their own. Thing number three, that's what I said. Then thing number four is this. I know that my ultimate goal in life is to get closer and closer to the one that sits on the throne. And he has told me how to get closer to him is to listen for his every instruction because his instruction is what? Is what bids you to come. Peter said to the Lord Jesus when he saw him walking on water, he says, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come. And that is the reason why it is critical for us to magnify in our hearts the presence of God because until we know how to press into his presence, there is no way we will get closer. We can be going different directions, but we're only going to go forward when we're getting closer to him. Now these four things I received from the Holy Spirit because I was asking him a couple of questions concerning the last two, three messages or so that I have preached. I'm like, Lord Jesus, you showed me the soldiers who were feeling like they were at a distance from you. And the way you rectified what seemed to be their disadvantage was that you allowed for them to hear the sound of your voice. Remember that from, I think, Tuesday last week? And he said, turn around, repent, and then you will find that I am closer to you than you thought. So that you are not trying to have a relationship with God based on the chronicles of the ones who have gone ahead of you. But now you're cultivating your relationship with him as a personal revelation or as a personal relationship that is based on revelation. To repent is to stop trying to be religious in your approach to the things of God, but to become personal by recognizing that that Jesus is just right behind you. Because I was asking, I said, what is the practical way of doing that? And what does it mean to have someone so close behind you? That means you are in their presence. Jacob says, the Lord was here and I knew it not because he was looking in the wrong direction. But the moment you turn to the right direction, you find that he is there. So let me help you with this little nugget. Come with me to Romans chapter 12 verse 3. I'm going to help you with a little nugget here. And then after that, we'll go to Psalms 103 verse 9. But let's look at Romans first of all. Romans 12 3. I'm going to read it very quickly because I want to combine the two of them and make it make sense. Praise God. Now, Romans 12, 3, and then it will make sense. I mean, for I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. The problem with many of us is that we think of ourselves 
too much. So we occupy every consciousness that we have and that is the reason why God feels so distant. Right? When a person is distant from you, from your perspective, what becomes of them? They become small. So when someone is distant from you, they become small. But when that person is close to you, they become big. This thing is math. So if it is big, then it is close. If it is small, then it is far. So if you want Jesus to be close to you and you want to be close to him, he needs to be bigger in your thoughts than you. Does it make sense? So a practical way of following the instruction that God gave to us about making a U-turn so that we can no longer be as far and then not be as close is to begin to think of ourselves less. Let me give you four examples, maybe two because of time, of how to think of yourself less. Alan asked me the other day, he was like, man of God, when you came on the call to minister to us on Monday, he said, the experience was phenomenal. Phenomenal. He said, because we, he said it was like you were literally laying hands on us, even though it was over the phone. He said, how do you prepare for a meeting like that? I wanted to respond, but the Holy Spirit said to me, no. And when the time came today, he was talking about something else, and the Holy Spirit said to me, now he's ready. And I told him, I said, the way that I prepare is that the Lord has graced me by obedience, praise God, and by his own mercy to think of myself less when I am preparing to minister. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, do not premeditate what you will say when they call you to speak. And why did he say that? Because the more they think about what they're going to say, they will say of their own and leave no room for him to speak. You understand what I mean? Because sometimes I can get so critical and analytical in my thinking and that gets in the way of what God wants to do. So I told Alan, I said, do you know that sometimes when I get on the call like that, the Holy Spirit allows for me to see conversations that we have had that I was not even conscious of. Because he knows me. If he allows me to be conscious of every single conversation that we're having, I would want to champion the conversation sometimes. I make it my own. Ask my wife. You can even ask almost anybody here because you know me sometimes the moment you say one thing, I want to say four. Because the moment you open up a subject, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I read that the other day. Oh, I saw this the other day. My wife is like, okay, can you now let me speak? Sometimes my wife will pass by me and I'm talking to people on the phone and she'll be like, let them say at least one thing. <laughs> Alan is trying not to smile because he knows how true it is. You see? And because God knows that I am a hijacker of conversations, he allows for me to be unconscious of those conversations sometimes. He was tough. He you know, was very tough to listen to God because I, I like to hear myself. You understand what I mean? But God, in his goodness, has allowed for me to learn how to let him speak so that I can truly be his oracle. It was a commandment by God. It's not even a suggestion. The Bible says, whoever must speak, let him speak as an oracle of God. An oracle is a mouthpiece. It's like a microphone and a speaker. You're not saying your own words. I mean, what has any man got to give to another? When the Bible says there is nothing anyone has that he has not received from above, we need to learn how to humble ourselves before the Lord so that the grace of God can come through. You understand what I mean? And then when you're speaking to people, the word that God has given to you, know in your heart that God did not need you. He could have spoken to them directly. You are just a witness. So you should be thankful for the privilege instead of you feeling like, I'm the man. No, you're nobody. Without the grace of God, we all are but dust. You understand what I mean? Because it is this sense of appreciation of the magnitude of the grace of God that allows you as a man to have, a, to have any ounce of humility within you. Because if you do not magnify the Lord and the grace by which he communicates his goodness to men, you would always think of yourself more highly than you need to. A lot of us are suffering a lot of de deprivation in our lives by the mercy of God. Because God knows that if you have those things before you have that humility, you will be self-destructive. You understand what I mean? 
Oh, because God wants to give to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. In fact, he has. But then he will not give to you more than he can handle. He knows that you still need to graduate from school of humility before he gives you that money, before he gives you that spouse, before he gives you that house. Because he knows the moment you move into that neighborhood, ain't nobody tell you nothing. Some people, you will just, the moment you close the deal on that property, you go to your phone and you start deleting numbers. Like, this person is no longer at my level. Swipe. You'll be swiping left or right, whichever one it is. But I tell you what, the reason why God is saying to us, just be humble, is because he knows how much you need him. So you want, to, you want Jesus to be close to you? Remember the equation. The equation is, if it is big, that means it is close. If it is small, that means it is far. One of the ways by which God started to teach me that principle was one day my wife and I were talking and I was yelling. And the Lord said to me, why are you yelling like you are at the mailbox? If you've been to our house, you know that our mailbox is like a mile away from the house. So that example suited me right. The Holy Spirit says, the person you're talking to is in front of you and you're yelling. And then it dawned on me. Now, wait a minute. Why do people yell when they're talking to the people who are close to them? He said, because you are so full of your own understanding of how the situation is. So this other person you're talking to looks so small in your eyes because she's so far away from what you think is the ideal situation. That is the reason why when we're in conversations and we're arguing with people, we yell. No, you don't yell to the person who is in front of you. But when you think you know it all, then you become the giant in the situation. And that person is so far away. And that's why you think you have to yell so that they can hear you. No, humble yourself. And then you people can speak as a man will speak to his friend face to face. You understand what I mean? And God is saying that we need to learn how to humble ourselves by magnifying the grace of God. So whatever it is that God is asking you to do, Courtney, don't think of how well you can do it or if you can do it. Think about God doing it himself and you just coming to be the face for the glory. Let me say that again. We're not sharing the glory. We're just the face for it. You understand what I mean? So if you think about any situation at all, the moment you can see Jesus doing that stuff and you just coming along for the ride, then it becomes easy. Because you're asking me to go forgive that dude after all of what he did, I ain't going. But if it is Jesus, well, we know what he does. He forgives everybody. I'm just going to follow him to go and have that conversation about forgiveness. And then it becomes easy because then it is yet not I, but Christ who is in me. Christ is in you, but you're trying to shove him into the wardrobe. So that anybody who comes into your life, you are the person that they see. We're tired of seeing your ugly face. You're not even nice. We just want to see that Jesus. Can you step aside, my friend, and let us see the Jesus that is the glory of God in human beings? Think about it for a moment. Because no matter how beautiful we are on the outside, we still aren't beautiful when it compares to Jesus. Let him increase as you decrease. Let's go to Psalms 103. He got really quiet in here. But it's okay. You're going to love me later. Psalms what? 103. Anybody remember the verse? I think I said nine. Psalms 103 verse nine. Oh, praise the Lord. And then we're going to pray. What does it say? Verse nine says, he will not always strive with us. Nor will he keep his anger forever. I want us to dwell on the A part today. He will not always strive with us. God wants us to go forth. He wants us to move closer. And he knows that to move closer, we need to obey his word. We need to magnify him. But he will not always strive with you. The Bible says, surely there is an end. A time is coming wherein you would have to deliver what is in your hand. So when it comes 
to doing these things, the matters of pressing into his presence, of opening up your heart so that he can cleanse you, of recognizing that whatever you want to ask, you should ask when you are closest to him so that you can only ask in accordance to his will and of the righteousness because of filthiness is already blown away by the light of his kindness and goodness. All of that, including following every word that he speaks. You see, that all of that put together in one dimension becomes a thing of fruitfulness and possibilities when you recognize that there is a sense of urgency that you need to associate with everything that I just said. He is not going to strive with you forever. The door of the ark was not open forever. Many of us, wants to give, we want to give ourselves forever to make a change, but you do not have forever to make a change. There is a line that has been drawn and it's called the end. And the Bible says, surely there is an end and the expectation of the righteous will not be cut off. God is coming to reward the righteousness. So don't wait forever. Tell yourself, I can no longer continue to argue with God. I can no longer continue to disobey. I can no longer continue to be full of myself. That sense of urgency would allow for change to be prompt in your life. Now let me say, I say this not so that you can come under pressure, but I say this so that you can be quick in righteousness. The Bible says the Lord quickens our steps unto righteousness. He is doing his part. Don't drag your feet. You understand what I mean? Because he's been waiting and waiting and waiting, but you would rather be in the presence of everybody else but in his presence. Let this sense of urgency be the accelerator of your commitment. Let this sense of urgency be the catalyst to, to the process of change and repentance that you need in your life. I do not want to be at the back of the line. I want to be close to Jesus. And to be close to him is I need to turn around and let him be big in my life. To magnify him. The Holy Spirit said to me that I needed to give you one more example. When it comes to Allowing yourself to think more highly of Jesus than you think of yourself. This is an example that I have given before, but I believe it needs to be given again. You need to retrain yourself. The Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that which is good and that which is acceptable and ultimately that which is the perfect will of God. And how do you do that? By recognizing that there is an animal in you that, need to be, that needs to be trained. So when it comes to the area of fending for yourself, that's, that even sounds wrong. Because we're not made to fend for ourselves. All we are made to do is to obey God. Why do we walk? Because God commands it. Before God told men to till the ground or to tend the garden, everything was already done. I mean, think about it. He already planted the garden. He already did everything. He didn't ask him to create anything. He just gave him an opportunity to enjoy it. That was why he says, six days you shall work. And on the seventh, you shall rest. Why do we work? Because God commands it. Because I don't need to work to make anything happen because God has already made everything happen. I'm only doing it because it is one of the ways by which he tests my heart and allows me to be more like Christ. You need to have that revelation because if you don't, you would always work to be paid rather than working to be a blessing. You know, I said this many years ago. Some people stopped coming to church because of it. I told them, I said, if you go to work because of what you're going to get, you are not living in righteousness. You must always go to work because of what you want to give. Because many people show up at work and just wait for that paycheck. But you should go to work because you understand that you carry within you the glory of the Son of Man, the Word that became flesh, the same Word by whom all things were made. I need to go to that work to see what I can add to them. How can I make this place better? How can I make my clients' lives better? This employer that I am under for now, how can I make their lives better? Joseph became the prime minister of the known civilization just because he wanted to help. God is the provider. You see, and so the example then is this. Whenever anybody hits you, with a thing that places a demand on you, you need to learn how to deflect it to Jesus. Because 
a lot of us, we first of all take it on like, oh my God, now we need to pay school fees. Oh my God, we need to do this. I need to do that. And every time you say that you need to, then you are taking the place of God. So stop saying that I need to do this. Say, oh, this needs to be done. But God has already done all things that pertains to my life and godliness. So your question is not how do I do this? The question should be how do I receive what you have already done? Where do I need to position myself? You see, by so doing now, you are letting him lead you. A while ago, one of our businesses needed funding. And in my usual thinking, I identified somebody that might be interested. And I called him and he said no, and I got angry. Near that because the Bible says, these are the works of the flesh. Anger. So when you're moving in the flesh, you are bound to end up being angry. If you call somebody on the phone out of the flesh, it will, end, it, will end, it will not end in praise. Because the Bible says when you walk in the flesh, you cannot fulfill the things of the Spirit. You understand what I mean? And likewise, he who walks in the flesh, in the Spirit, will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so, because I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me, you don't have to call that guy. I was like, Holy Spirit, do you not know how much money he has? He sold his company and they're about to pay him the last round of payment. He's about to make so much money that he wants to leave the country so that he doesn't have to give everything else back. I'm not going to give more details so those who know him may not know who I'm talking about. But I was, I was trying to convince the Holy Spirit that I knew what I was saying. Now you can laugh, but we all do it. Quite often we try to convince the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is asking you to pick up the phone and apply for a job. And you're trying to tell the Holy Spirit that you don't even, the Holy Spirit, do you even know what they're asking for? I don't have what they're asking for. But the Holy Spirit is the one telling you to apply for it. But we want to school the teacher. <laughs> My wife can tell you this story. There was a time that because of some experiences that I had, had, that I had, had in business about 12 years, maybe 12, 13 years ago, I decided that I was going to construct the way that I wanted my future career to go. And I plotted everything in my mind, which was the same thing that I did that didn't work. But for some reason, I convinced myself that the third time was a charm. And the Lord was so good to me because he revealed to me the futility of my thoughts. And I was like, oh, oh snap. Okay, so if that's not going to work, what do I do? He says, seek me. And when I started seeking him, he came into the room where I was and introduced himself to me as the Holy Teacher, not the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. But when you keep thinking about him just as the Holy Spirit, you're always just thinking about, oh, this wind of God, this power of God, this. You know, he came and told me that he was the Holy Teacher, which was what Jesus said. He, he would send, if you ask the Father, he would send another comforter and he would teach you all things. He's the teacher, he's the comforter, he's your paraclete. Is the one that is called alongside with you, technically, your friend. But then you don't think about him in that light. And then when he said he was the holy teacher, I'm like, okay, okay, now it makes sense. Now what shall we do, teacher? Tell me what to do. I'm done trying to tell you what to do. So what do we do, folks? The Bible says it will not forever strive with us. Who? The Holy Spirit. God says my spirit will not forever strive with man because he's indeed flesh. So if you want to continue to enjoy his advances, then stop being flesh. Humble yourself, reduce yourself. So I called this person and then of course he insulted me. Not directly, but he kind of insulted my intelligence because he told me that my plan was lousy. Which it was. And so what did I do? I got angry and then the Holy Spirit said, are you done? I said, okay, I'm done. Thank you for letting me get that out of my system. So now what? You tell me what to do. And he said to me, I already told you what to say. And I said it. Even though my wife doesn't like to hear it because I'm always saying it. Anytime they ask me to do something, I say, money cometh. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you know what to say. And I said, money cometh. And a few hours later, somebody reached out to me. And he says, I need to see you. I thought he wanted to ask me Bible questions because that's what he typically does. And then he was like, I have money that I don't know what to do with. I said, you have come to the right place. <laughs> yes, you have come to the right place. The robber has just made the road. You see what I mean? It was that easy because the Lord is the doer. He says, the things that I have commanded of you, I will perform it. 
Faithful is he who was called who will also do it. So whenever anything hits you, just reduce yourself and let that arrow go boom to the one who cares for you. Because God is preparing to give to us power. But he wants us to know that when he gives to us that power, we need to allow him to wield that power through us. Because if you're still in control and you get a hold of the God kind of power, you would destroy nations. And it didn't call you to destruction, it calls you to life. So I told you two scriptures, we're just going to keep it at that and then we're going to break bread. We're going to break bread from Genesis chapter 21. And, but don't forget, do not forget the Romans chapter 12 that we read, the, Genesis, the Psalms 103 verse 3 that we read. In fact, let me do you a favor. Instead of taking you to Genesis and starting your second sermon, let's just read one more verse from that Psalms 103. And then we're going to call it a day. So this is for breaking bread. Praise God. Psalms 103. And we're going to read verse 6. We read verse 9. Now we're going to read verse 6. Because we need wings to fly. Amen. Alrighty. So 103 verse 6. Look at what it says. And I'm, we're going to read the A, the A part again. Okay? Praise the Lord. Sometimes this is the way by which God releases wisdom in us. Right? By giving us a word. You know how they say that a word is enough for the wise. Sometimes one of the things that happens is this. The wisdom of God and the, the, the wisdom of God and the divine insight that you're supposed to receive is already on the inside of you. And what God wants is for there to be a flow. So when he gives you a word, that word is a siphon, right? Which is like when, you're, when you get a pipe and you want to siphon gas from someone's car or from another vessel to another, you don't draw the entire thing with your mouth. You only pull a little and then it creates a momentum. And everything else begins to flow. Because there is already living water on the inside of you. I'm just telling you this so that the next time you are somewhere or I'm speaking or God is speaking to you and is using half of verses to speak to you, it is a process of siphoning wisdom from you. Okay? So we've read how many verses of scripture today? Um, just now we, we read Psalms 109, 103 verse 9 and we read only the A part. And we're reading another A part. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you know what I'm doing. I say, yes, you're drawing wisdom, okay? So I want you to just know that the wisdom to operate in the things that have been so commanded and reminded today is being released to you as we speak. So look at the A part of Psalms 103 verse 6. It says, the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. I want us to focus on the A part, the Lord executes. Who is the doer? Who is the executor? the Lord. To execute means to do, means to perform. The Lord is not saying you will execute righteousness and justice because we're going to be here till Jesus comes and we will still not be able to do it because it's already said by heaven that the works of righteousness of men are like filthy rags before God. We can't possibly deliver righteousness or justice. We don't have what it takes. And God did that on purpose so that we can always receive the one that he has Look at the boys who came ahead of us who were equipped with so much and thought they could do without God. They were kicked out of heaven because they felt like they were all that. And so God came and made man from the dust of the earth so that man will never have any way or anything with which to boast before the Lord. I mean, come on. You are made out of the base most thing, the lowest thing. Do you know that under the ocean there is still land? So land is the lowest level and that's what God made you out of. What a privilege so that you can never be full of yourself. You understand what I mean? And so the Bible says, the Lord is the executor. He's the one that does it. And I'm like, praise the Lord. The pressure just gets lifted. Because I don't have to do anything other than to get closer to him and to do everything that he says and to trust him and to magnify him and to remain my little self before the Lord. Because the smaller I am before the Lord, the bigger he is. But guess what the world is going to see? The world is going to see the Lord. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So today as we break bread, I want you to say to yourself, I resign from being the executor. Jesus is divine. I am just a branch. 
He produces righteousness in me. He rewards my obedience and my humility and my commitment to his love with righteousness. He is the performer of that which he commands. I resign from being the executor. I am the receiver of all good things. I am the receiver of mercy. I am a receiver of grace. I stay here receiving so that his glory continues to be seen through my life. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, as we partake of the Lord's body today and drink of Jesus' blood, may we be truly reminded of who he is and who we are. He said as often as we have the opportunity that we need to do this in remembrance of him. So we need to remember that he is the one that performs all things. That he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And as we continue to yield and surrender, we will no longer be agitated when we are in your presence. We will no longer feel that we need to leave your presence to go and do something. But we abandon ourselves in your presence because you are the doer of all things and allow the wind of your Holy Spirit to carry us to where we need to be for your namesake. And I'm in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for the deliverance that is taking in place, that is taking place in here today. Thank you for accepting these resignations that we are tendering so that for the next chapter of our lives, Christ is seeing in us the hope of glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of of him I'm still going to give us Genesis chapter 21 verse 16 anyway because for some reason I just know that we have to get into it it's like so kind of like breaking bread on the double today praise the Lord The Bible says in Genesis chapter 21 verse 16, this is the account of Hagar and Ishmael. The Bible says, and she went, that is Hagar, and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, you know, the distance of an arrow. For she, for she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. Verse 17 says, And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What hails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Who was crying? Who did God hear? The woman was crying out of unbelief. She was crying out of frustration. But the Lord heard the boy. You see, the boy in this case represents faith. The name Ishmael means that the Lord will hear. And so what I'm telling you is you need to have that confidence that the Lord hears you always, that he knows what you have need of even before you ask. Be confident in that and stop crying. And stop feeling frustrated and feeling desperate because God does not hear frustration. He does not hear desperation. Hebrews lets us know that without faith, Hebrews chapter 6, I believe, verse 1, that is without faith, it is impossible to please God. God does not move by sympathy. Yes, he will have compassion, but compassion is not the same thing as sympathy. So what do you do? Let the lad inside of you, let the faith inside of you speak. That is all that God hears. And so that is the word for somebody here. You think God is going to hear your frustration and how you're tired of a status quo and how you're tired of things and tired of people? Okay. You're not the first person to be tired of that same person. And God is like, and so he wants to hear faith. Hagar was yelling. And she was so close to the boy, but God did not hear her. He heard the lad. God wants to hear the faith in you, not the frustration. So you need to adjust your conversation with God, especially now that you're getting closer and closer. We're going to rise up and we're going to pray. One more prayer. Amen.
And I'm going to just read this verse of scripture to you. And that's, I want you to pray it as I read it. Praise the Lord. Every tree that does not bear good fruits is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by the fruits, you will know them. I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that every tree that has not been planted by my Father, that has somehow managed to take root in your lives, will be cut down. So that you will be a bearer of good fruits. Every tree that is a function of a false doctrine, every tree that you allowed him in because of insecurities and fears that have been bearing more fruits of fear and insecurity in your life, let them be cut down at the voice of the Lord. At the word of the Lord, let them be cut down. Your heart is a good soil that produces good fruits because it accommodates only good trees. And so every tree that has not been planted by my father is cut down and you will know them because you will no longer see those fruits in your lives. Begin to give God thanks because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. You will no longer have to struggle with the bad fruits because the Lord has taken care of the bad trees. Just give him praise. Celebrate this chance and this second chance that he has given to you to be a bearer of good fruits and do not return to your vomit. In the mighty name of Jesus. It's a new day communion house and you have received a new visitation in a brand new way. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just give God praise. Let us just give him praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Alrighty. Alrighty. So let's be seated for one second. Alan is just going to come and say a prayer um, over the offerings. And um, I want to just remind you again, the Bible says, let everyone give, give as he has proposed in his heart. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let us not just give what is convenient. Let us always ask, what will you have me give? The Bible says concerning the grace of God that it is the grace of God, by the grace of God, that we are able to experience God in our lives as the one who gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. If I give just because it's convenient that I am championing my own generosity, but if I give because I first of all ask the Lord, what will you have me give? Let him tell you that which is seed out of that word. What, out of what he has put in your hands. I say this because we need to start to practice faith and faithfulness in all of what we do. The same thing applies to the study word, to the word study situation in your life. Ask him, where would he have you go? What should you focus on? Should you study the prophets? Should you study the poems? The, the poetry? Should you go and read the epistles? You need to let him lead you. You are a sheep in his fold. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. None of us here had to teach our children that, okay, in this house, when you hear this, that is my voice. No, they just know. So even you already know the voice of God, you just need to learn how to block out the noise of self-willed opinions and follow what he says. And so, if I don't just come with the announcements, I'm just going to say a prayer today over our hearts when it comes to the things of generosity. I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, that we will learn and begin to apply the significance of hearing God concerning everything, even beginning now in the mighty name of Jesus. So just ask him what he would have you give because our giving is another way of honoring the Lord. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance. We do not give because it is the law because we are not under law. When we tithe, we don't tithe because it's the law. We tithe because we want to honor God. When we give, we give not because it's the law. We give because we want to honor God. So all of what we do as New Testament believers, we need to do by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And let that be the beginning of a new giving and receiving relationship with the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus. And so, as far as giving today is concerned, the instructions are on the screen and the offering basket, I believe is right there. And so if, you, if you're giving cash or writing a check or you need an envelope, you can make your way there. And while we're doing that, I'm going to say this and just give us a minute to package our offering. 
the Lord is further along with you than you are aware of. Trust Him to build you up. Trust Him to be your strength. Trust Him to pray through you, to help you in all your infirmities. As you trust Him, all of the burden that you have carried will begin to fall off. The Lord is giving you a breather, take it. The Lord is giving you peace, receive it. The Lord is giving you joy, embrace it. Let Him love you. Remember, you have already been set free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Don't take the burdens that He already set you free from. Don't pick them back up. Stay free. Stay trusting. Stay in surrender. The Lord is with you. In Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for the offerings that we bring today and the times. We thank you because more than the substance receive our hearts, O oh God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not going to hold this. Y'all know what we do tomorrow, Wednesday, 9 p.m., live on Instagram. We're going to be tapping into prayer for Second Watch. Please join us. It's been off the chain. We thank God for how he has really just been dealing with us there. And we'll be back at it this Saturday, 6.30 p.m. Let's lock in. Come ready for praise, worship, ministry, and encountering the Lord. Amen. Father, we give you praise so much for what you have done with us tonight, O oh God. And we ask of thee for traveling mercies as we go to and fro. Lord, take us by the hand that we may run with what you have delivered to us tonight. All glory and honor belong to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Have a blessed night.